Rolling. My name is Vaughn Brown Russell. I was born in Bridgeville, September 28, 1925. I had two brothers and a sister. I went to Bridgeville High School. In the 11th grade, uh, I, on my birthday, on the 28th of September in 42, I went to Philly, enlisted in the Marines. On the way home, my mother and sister had planned to take me out to dinner and ironically picked me up, and they began to demand explanations why I wasn't in school. And uh, so I explained, and my mother emphatically said, I will not sign. Well, there was a fellow who had a contract for pollen in Baltimore, and he took it over to the shipyard there, and we'd take 80, 90-foot pile, and I'd meet him down at the corner store at 8.30 in the morning and get home 3.30, the school hours. I did that for the whole month. And one day we got over in Baltimore and got lost and uh, got downtown Baltimore, and I had to get a wrecker to lift the rear wheels up. We'd go forward. I, net result, I got home at 8 o'clock at night, so the, the explanation was needed. And you didn't lie to my father. When you confronted him, he looked you in your soul. He said, I told him I hadn't been there the whole month. Well, he, he said to me, he said, if you'll get your education, uh, when you get out, I'll sign for you to go. Well, I, we went up to Philly, and I, the day I was sworn in, and he had a long and lengthy talk with the doctor and I didn't know to the, after the war when I got home. He knew the doctor, and the doctor said, I can keep him in the States till he's 18. Well, I went to Marine boot camp and uh, was sent to Boston, Massachusetts. I, uh, every time a volunteer list came out, I volunteered for the Marine Raiders, the Paramarines, everything. I couldn't get out of the place. I didn't know what in the Sam Hill was going on, but I just couldn't get out. And I didn't know until after the war he'd made this arrangement. When I was 18 and a half, gone. But up until that time, I couldn't get out of the place. While I was there, I was honor guard for President Roosevelt, James Cagney, Duke and Duchess of Windsor. She came up to me and said, uh, where have you been? And I couldn't help but laugh. I said, that's not Baltimore language. She was from Baltimore. And also made acquaintance with, uh, oh, I can't think of, one of the movie stars was in the Coast Guard, came in their uh, Navy Yard at one time. And uh, I got some stories. I don't know how long this is supposed to go, but I, I've got some stories I could tell about that. But I'll fast forward and go to... Uh, when I got 18 and a half, oh, in the interim, our colonel had his son uh, go into Marine Corps, out of college, 90 days he was landed on tower and was killed. So he decreed that every man under his command would know all the fine points of the Marine Corps when he went overseas. So when I went overseas, I was one of the better trained people because I had had it at all. So I had gone to this school, and I'll tell you this quick one. I was in map reading class, and it was ugh. So I sat in the back seat, and I guess the lieutenant sensed that I wasn't paying attention. He said to me, Russell, what's the technical definition of a map? I said, a map is a means of which you gain direction. He said, wrong. Stay after class. After class, he gave me a stack of chalk that high, and he said, uh, fill these three blackboards at a right angle, three, three. He drew down two inches, and this is what he had had me write. I wrote left-handed, right-handed, a printed. A map is a conventional representation of a portion of the Earth's surface as a plane surface. So I went back to the barracks, and I thought, some smart will go over there and erase it. So in the middle of the night, I went over there to look, and they're still there, so I was safe. So the next morning, he confronted me and said, you think you'll remember that? I said, yes, sir, until he slammed the old lid on the box. I'll be reciting that. So again, I went, over, went to uh, Deep River, North Carolina, and got 
fine-tuned for things that I'd already known, and I checked out and every weapon the Marine Corps had except artillery. I never got involved with artillery. I had gone down to the first sergeant's office one day, and he uh, uh, had, uh, I had a black eye, had been in a fight with one of the other Marines. He, he said, I've just got to make up a list of people to go to judo school. You're on it. <laughs> so I went to judo school. I even knew judo, and it's still proficient to some degree. I was on the border patrol later in life, so I uh, uh, was instructor there because they didn't have any such program. Anyway, we shipped uh, cross country in pretty primitive means. It was like a uh, freight car. It wasn't as plush as a poem, it was a freight car. And when we got to Arizona, we ran out of food, and all they had left, they had butter. So I, a guy bet me that I wouldn't eat a pound of butter for $5. Well, $5 is a lot of money. And I ate that pound of butter, but I'll tell you, it was hard going that last little, I ate that old pound of butter. And I won't tell you for this interview what he said about it. anybody would eat a pound of butter. So we went into uh, uh, Camp Pendleton, and we were in casualty company there waiting to go overseas. And uh, uh, Kay Kaiser came in there with his who later was his wife, maybe at that time, Milton Martha Tilton, he said. So I said to the guy, you cover me while I uh, go get a good seat for this this K. Kaiser thing at night. So he did, only the guy was counting and he came up a couple guys short, me and another guy, and he says, so he had him. he called her name, everybody stepped forward and I came up short. So. It was the last weekend in the States, and I was put on, confined to barracks. Well, we had a crap game going, <laughs> Me and some more, and the captain came in, and the captain had been a, in the Marine Air Wing, and he flew under Brooklyn Bridge. So they grounded him, took his wings away, and put him in the fleet, in the uh, assault forces. And he's, he's, he's winning all the money, and he says, Aren't you two guys the guys that got caught short on mustard last night? And it was, everybody had left 8 o'clock in the morning. It was about noonish, 1 o'clock. He says, go ahead, head to town, get out. So we, he let us go out. We whipped it up pretty good. I had some people in Hollywood uh, come down with a, with a with something in a hotel lobby at night. They, you couldn't get a room. Of course, we were late. And... Uh, of this limousine came, a chauffeur limousine says, I'm looking for some guys to take to one of the stars wants to entertain him with his estate. Nah, we don't want to go to that. So I've often reflected back. I might have made a contact there when I passed on it. We got out of, we sailed out of, a guy had told me, if you give your military special, I think it was 945, you'll man the secondary batteries on the ship, you'll get in the chow call, before anybody else, and you, there's a benefit there. So I went in there and they said, what's your specialty? And I told them, they, they signed me to secondary batteries. I didn't know beans about a 40 millimeter, but I am up here on a 40 meter, and I got a, a colored chow card, so I, could, I didn't wait in line forever. I just went on in. And Everybody, the guy on the bottom rack was the biggest guy. I don't remember how many racks, maybe f four, five, I don't know. But he gets seasick. I didn't get seasick. We got in a hurricane out, out of uh, San Diego between there and Hawaii, and I'm telling you, I walked out on the deck one time when I had a guard posted, and I snuck out and had a look. I, didn't, I saw all one see that bow that ship was going down, and you see this trough of water. I came back inside. But I never got sick. And I remember that you had tables, and they had strong arms with seats. And I just sat down. I waited and got my child. And I remember I had an orange, and I had pork chops. I just got this down when this guy next year got upset. He, he threw up in my child. And by the time I made that that garbage barrel, I was sick. But I, I was one of the last ones to get sick. We uh, waited to Anna Weetok, 
and they were making the landing on Guam and uh, Saipan. So everybody down to the letter M or N went to the second or fourth division up on Saipan, and everybody from there down went to uh, uh, Guam. So we went down to Guam. And <laughs> we're walking down there, and this lieutenant came up, put his arm around my shoulder, and says, "How you doing, Russ?" And I'd had a run-in with him a few times, and uh, I thought you want to be friends now. Do you? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I didn't say that, but he sat there and. Uh, we got assigned, and I went to this company, and uh, I was kind of a happy-go-lucky kid. I didn't take anything serious. Well, I had barely got in the company, and uh, uh, Guam was loaded with Japs. They had them there clear into the late 60s, and they told us at the time, I don't know how true, the Gu Guam jungles were the thickest in the world, and Guam... Uh, We've been out on patrols, and I was on a patrol one time, and I saw a little lagoon in there, and the streamers are light, and I said, this I, this looks like a setting for a Tarzan movie. And I stopped momentarily, and I was the last man in that patrol, and my patrol had gone. I couldn't even hear them. That's how quick that jungle absorbed that sound. And I ran up, and I probably didn't go 30 feet, but I just stopped and hesitated on the last man. Japs were everywhere. I remember Christmas of 44, uh, we got called out on Christmas Day and spent the whole day. Uh, the first platoon, I I thought, they, this Marine Corps only knows the first platoon because anything came up, it was the first platoon. And uh, so we went out and uh, we, all day long, and we almost got a fight started because we started, stopped at a submarine rest camp and they were sitting there drinking beer with the uh, you can see the beads of uh, uh, sweat coming down the cans that indicate they'd been cooled in our beer we got two cans a week ten dollars a can it sold for it was called lucky lager had a cross on it lucky lager and uh, we uh, the Guys saying, don't you wish you'd join the Navy and all that? Man, they almost got a fight started. <laughs> but it didn't. And we, we kept rehearsing for Iwo Jima. We didn't know it at the time. Rumor had it, we are going up the road or the next hour had plenty of Japs on it. And they said our regiment was going to take it. They thought that. And always, in all this thing, Sir Bocce was down here which turned out to be Suribachi. And we always attacked this way, towards Suribachi. And we had a few rounds fall short, kill a few people. And I was on, when we were on that particular program, I was on uh, sentry duty. And this guy was walking, tall guy. I knew he was no Japanese, because he had, he'd been, a, as it turned out, a professional basketball player. And his name, I had his name for years, I can't think of it at the moment, but he was somebody that you recognized. And uh, I called to him, halt. He didn't halt. I, I said, halt. He didn't halt. So I took the rifle, I thought I'd fire one over his head. He was sleepwalking. And uh, he, he, he got sent home because of that, sleepwalking. Well, we... Uh, I'm trying to think of everything. Oh. And you're still on Guam. Still on Guam. And uh, on j j we were out on another patrol, and I was looking at a Japanese tank and a, and a bazooka that hit it and made a little hole. When I looked in that tank, there were body parts all over the place. It, it had just tore him up. And we went in, and we were in a patrol, and when we came under fire, one guy would go here and go here, and I was automatic rifle assistant at the time. We'd switch off because it was so heavy. And a BAR opened up, an automatic rifle. So we all dove. And what it was, a Jap straggler on the islands uh, was y yielding to the call of nature. 
and he had his rifle stacked beside a tree and he reached for it and when this guy seen that movement he shot him with this BAR. So that's what it turned out. And uh, a couple of patrols we went out and we'd, we'd find where they had been because the matting that they use in the caves for where they slept it was warm where they had been somebody had been there and I never did figure out unless it was coming from Rotor they had clean uniforms and uh, uh, rifles had all the equipment they all looked pretty pretty good shape as though they were being resupplied and I figured it I found out after the war that uh, they were coming over from Rota this island that we were supposed to take so our guys for the most part had been overseas 33 months and uh, they uh, I went to the theater it was hard to concentrate on the movie because that moon would come right up out of that water it was awesome and and uh, the theater screen was there and you, you know, I'm trying to watch a movie and I'm watching this moon thinking that's the same moon we got back home <laughs> and uh, this major came out the lights came on usually it was an air raid and uh, he came out and said there's been a breakthrough in Europe and the German armies are running unchecked toward the French coast. Well, rumor had it our old timers, 33 month guys, were going to go back to the States for Christmas. So the movie started again, and uh, we in our tent area we had kerosene lamps. And uh, me and another guy were the only two there, everybody left. And I thought, well, it's bad news, but there's nothing I can do about it. So, and then the movie was arsenic and old lace. I never seen it before, and I've seen it part of it since. And I just remember that guy charging up the stairs all the time, or down the stairs, whichever. And so I remember that. And the next thing, New Year's rolled around, and they gave everybody a case of beer. We had no way to cool it. Everybody got bombed out of their skull, including me. And uh, we had a formation every morning at 6 o'clock. We got in our platoon, two guys were out <laughs> me and another guy. Next platoon had three or four, and finally the skipper said, get back to your tent area and boost your buddies out. Well, we got that's the sorriest looking formation I've ever seen in the Marine Corps. And uh, so we came out, and then he read a list of what had happened. Guys were in a brig, guys were in a hospital, they took a mortar and almost hit a picket boat. They did everything. So right after that, we had uh, Bob Hope come to Guam, and uh, Skipper wouldn't let us go. He said, uh, you need training worse you need entertaining. And we didn't go. I always thought that was because a lot of our guys got lost. We had our final inspection, and a colonel came up to me, and if you can imagine, he had a, handle, had a mustache, and it was waxed out points. He looked, he's a tough-looking bird. And he sat there and he talked to you. <laughs> He'd do this to you. And he says, son, do those shoes fit? I said, yes, sir. You sure do shoes fit? I said, yes, sir. So when he got off, I said, that guy's got a case on shoes for some reason. I don't know what his, what his problem is. Well, we soon, because I was a Weisenheimer, I was always making a smart remark, and, and I got every duty that was out there. I was left to clean up the camp, and the rumor had it that we were going to get to ride to board ship to go on, the, as it turned out to be, he will. Well, it didn't turn out. We had to catch up. We had to double time to catch up with the rest that had marched across the island, and we had to get there before it was dark because the Japs owned the darkness. And uh, we got over there, and uh, we were stopped by CB camp and they those guys knew how to live they had wooden platforms in their tents electric lights all the perks of home and water coolers I saw this water cooler over there and this uh, I said the kid I said came by I said go and fill my canteens everybody had two and the guy said to me he'll run off of your canteens I said no it won't because I'm gonna run him down and get him and uh, he brought them back. When he brought mine back, uh, 
everybody gave him canteens to fill because we didn't have like, we didn't know what ice water was. Well, I was smart enough to know that you just wet your lips with ice water as hot as I was. As soon as these guys got back, uh, we we moved forward and we moved to an open field right opposite a CB camp. Well, this one guy who I later known, who I never knew, was named Job out of the Bible. He puts his canteen up and drinks this ice water and goes into shock and falls down the well. Corman recognized the symptoms came over, shot him and he passed out. But it was enough disturbance that the colonel came over and a CB commander. And he said, Colonel, my cooks have volunteered to know you guys are going off on a hard campaign and we volunteered to cook. And the colonel says, Marines always took care of theirself and I'm posting sentries. Nobody goes to the CB camp. We'll, we set out in the field and ate K rations, and his cooks had volunteered to cook us a hot meal. That's that's the way they ran things. So, of course, after dark, we all snuck over to movies anyway. <laughs> and uh, next day, we shipped out. Well, we were kind of down because I have a platoon leader, Lieutenant Jones from uh, Yorkville, Tennessee. He's, uh, his mother was the only one I wrote to after the war. And uh, he... Uh, was in Pearl Harbor with a hernia. And uh, he hitchhiked back. I'm on, <laughs> like they had me doing, <laughs> I had all the details. Uh, I was on deck and I saw this Higgins boat. It was real hot and humid. We were ready to pull up for Ewo. And uh, uh, I uh, saw this Higgins boat coming out and it's a lieutenant. He hitchhiked his way back, and everybody's morale was boosted. You know, you're comfortable old pair of shoes. And he had led them through Bougainville and Guam. And uh, he, uh, I w we were on a farm problem on Guam, and I'd fire my BAR clips and throw them away, <laughs> hoping to get new ones because of spring. It was World War One, and the springs would stick and miss far, and I was trying. End of the day, he came back with all. He was going back them and picking them all up. Says, "You know, we can't get new supplies." And I thought a lot of that guy, and uh, we uh, boarded ship, went up to Saipan, and I got bombed up Saipan one time. I, it, it was a real interesting night because I, I hadn't had any mail. We'd been on board ship for 38 days, and uh, I woke up at two or three in the morning. And I heard this. Planes, so I went up there and looked out, and tracers all over. It was a bad scene. Then we went up to Iwo, and uh, we went in, uh, I think it was D4. Uh, the flag was up, both flags were up, and uh, we, uh, I had found that by taking my pack straps off and putting across my larynx here. I could get out of this weight, and I I had a 72-pound pack, two hand grenades, 340 rounds of ammunition. I had 240 BAR ammunition clips and two bandoliers M1, because the weapon was so heavy, we'd switch it off. And uh, we had rehearsals, and uh, they uh, we were in line to disembark. And I had known, oh, I'm getting ahead of my story. We had a three-dimensional mock-up on the fan tail of the ship. And they said this is a 72-hour operation. Well, I had known better when they said that because I had gone with this special uh, chow card. I had gone down and listened to radio room reports. And uh, I, uh, I knew they were calling for far support. They were crying on the beach, and they ran me out of there because it was demoralizing to hear this, because they were crying for fire support. And waiting to disembark, uh, there was a battleship came up alongside us in a merchant vessel, and they unloaded ammunition. Must have been a whole day. And uh, then they pulled back in, off a slot, and they fired broadside. That ship actually moves in the water. And it, it, that is an awesome, awesome thing. And I noticed this destroyer right at the base of Suribachi, just throwing them in. And I thought, what guts? That guy's really got guts, but he's putting his whole ship at risk. And I saw another thing that struck me. A plane 
planes were diving on the island all the time, and I saw this one plane get off, and a black puff under the plane, and they kind of waved his wings a little bit, and there were ships everywhere. Had he abandoned his plane, he probably is a good chance of hitting a ship, and I always felt like he wrote it down because I kept saying, come on, guy, get out of there, and he never did. Came right down between two ships. Well, we were ready to, we were in line to disembark, but the night before, a, this Job, who I alluded to earlier, came to me and says, Russ, you're near Washington, D.C., aren't you? I said, yeah. He says, why don't you look my girl, my uh, fiancé up? I said, why aren't you going to look her up? He says, I'm not coming out. I said, uh, look, I have no attachments. You at least got a fiancé. And he, I said, uh, you're to be, I'll be the one to buy, buy the farm. No, I'm not coming out. And I kept pushing his hand away, and he had this address on there. And ironically enough, later I got stationed at Marine Corps headquarters. That's where I ended my military service, active duty. And uh, so that was the night before. Well, the next morning while we were in line, we had all this equipment on, of course. The corpsman up in front of me, and like I said, I was kind of lighthearted, and I reached up and slapped him back at the, under the helmet, and he turned around and punched the next guy right in the mouth. They had a heck of a fight, and I said, hey, hey, I did that. But it made no difference. It kept, kept right at it. Well, we get up to the landing net. That guy standing there with a box of chewing gum, giving us chewing gum as we go down the net. And if you ever get stressed, chewing gum is the way to go. I'm... I don't know whatever happened to that chewing gum, I expect I swallowed it. But anyway, I started down the net, and there was vertical chains and wooden slats. Well, three of those wooden slats broke going down that chain. And I, when I hit, I grabbed on, I was holding on that chain, when I, and then this boat was up and down like that. When I hit, I hit with a thud, and I thought, man, I, this deal I had arranged to get out of that in a hurry would have been in good stead. So we, we loaded boats, and you know, you, you ride around the big circle, and then the beach master says you. And when we came in, surf was so rough, we had to transfer from a landing boat personnel to a landing boat tank, which had a gunnel about that much higher. And we fell into that, and they kept saying to me, look at him, he's getting seasick, everybody seasick, but me. And they would come up to the, these straps I had across my throat and I was swallowing them. I said, no, I'm not sick. No, I'm not. I'm not sick. <laughs> and they kept saying, look at him. He's sick. They're all sick. And I'm the only one not sick. Riding around, this surf was rough. We hit the beach and I ran in there and that gangway went down. I went in there and I fell down on my knee and the lieutenant came up with the side of his foot and hit me in the butt and said, what's your problem? I said, man, I'm sick. He said, you're going to be a lot sicker if you don't get off this beach. It's hot. Well, we pulled in, and I'm a little rusty on, uh, this is not in chronological order. I went up, and we, I don't remember what we did, but uh, we, there was somebody had dug some foxholes. So I dug a fox, I took a foxhole that already been dug, and this assistant BAR was over here, and I was here, and I went to sleep. We were supposed to be on 15 minutes and off 15 minutes all night. I went to sleep, slept all night long, and next morning I had stones all over me. He wouldn't get out of his hole and be threw a stone. And he, I, he, he was using some pretty strong adjectives. He says, I can't believe anybody. They shelled us all night long, and I could hear you snoring all night long. I said, well, I was tired. He said, I don't believe anybody would be that tired. I said, I was I was tired. I slept through that first night show, and it was awesome. And uh, I got up that next morning, and they shelled us again. And uh, I looked over. I heard this sound, and looked over, and a dog handler had a Doberman with him, and that foxhole wasn't deep enough. That Doberman was making that dirt fly. <laughs> he was getting it deeper, and I here I am laughing, and and, and uh, I said that dog's not so dumb. He's digging that hole, so. We went immediately up to the line, 
And the guy who wanted me to take that paper was killed by a sniper right off the get-go. He was killed. I've had to live with that for a long time. But honest, with God as my witness, I thought I was boosting his morale. And uh, I just thought, if you if you got a death thought, it doesn't serve you. So we went on, we began to move up, and uh, they began to shell again, so we took cover. And uh, it it would when it got quiet, it would get so eerie quiet. So much is made of war and movies and all, but they don't get into some of the things that actually have, like the smell of war, the smell of dying and burning flesh. And uh, I, it, it got real quiet. And uh, I sensed something, and I kicked my safety off, and I looked up. And here's a sailor standing there, and he'd just been shelled minutes before. He had a dyed, he didn't have a white hat, he had a dyed blue hat. And I, I had pressure on that trigger, and it was a sensitive trigger. I, he, if he's alive today, he'll never know how close he was to being dispatched, because I said to him, where the Sam Hill did you come from? He said, I was on one of these rocket firing LSTs, and uh, I came ashore to get a souvenir. I said, well, you almost bought the final souvenir, because I, uh, I almost shot that guy. Uh, about that time, or these are events that I can recall, a tank moved through our lines, and uh, I thought, man, it, it, I should have been in tanks. They got a lot thicker exterior than I got in these dungarees. And that tank hit something big, and it blew off the ground. Both tracks blew off, and the whole body of the tank probably blew two, three foot off the ground. And the turret went on up another 15 or 20 feet, and a guy's legs was standing out there. And I remember that tank's name. To this day, it was called Helsopoppin. Had it written on the turret, Helsopoppin. And then, uh, so... Right after that, we moved up, and I remember a machine gun opening up on me, and I dove into a tank. There was a tank indentation in the sand, and uh, the guy in back of me landed with his helmet right in the middle of my back. Well, you can run a lot faster with a pack. I reached around with my my knife and just cut my pack right off because every time I get up he'd open up with that machine gun so he had me right in his sight. You, you just, they used smokeless powder, you, you couldn't see where it was coming from. I knew it was in this direction and uh, so uh, I said to this guy, hey, it's getting dark, we can't be called out here where we're known to be after dark. We got, I said I spotted a hole and uh, it was pretty good sized shell hole up front of it. And I said, before I do in this track, so I'll count three, you go, and then I'll count three more, and then I'll go. He said, okay, and all the time his his helmet edge of it was cutting me in my back. But what are you gonna do? You're under fire and the guy's laying right on top of you. So he went and nothing happened. So I knew just exactly how far I had to go, and I dove. I was right in midair. I wasn't even on the ground. And uh, a sniper fired, and I could feel that bullet go right across the front. I could feel that bullet. When it went right. That's how close he was to me. I mean, if I hadn't been in midair, he'd have got me for sure. So when I got in that, that shell hole, he said, did he get you? And I tried to tell him a couple times, I just shook my head, no. <laughs> and the next thing that I can remember, uh, we, uh, we'd taken some casualties. Each time they shelled, they got some of us. We were right in the center of the lines, and we entered that combat with between 240, 250 men. I never could get the exact figure down. But... Uh, I remember the, the tomb sergeant saying, we, we took a hill, and we were out the furthest, 
fifth division was here, the fourth division was here, and the third division, we were fresh troops. We punched a hole in this line and took a wrong hill. We were supposed to take, I don't remember, I think it was a 62, 462 or something like that. And uh, you would wonder after all these years how I remember this. I can remember these items, but I can't remember where I put my glasses or my hair in And we took this hill and the gunnish, or platoon, no, he was a gunny sergeant then. He came, he said, Russ, you cover us. Said, because this hill's too hot, it's the wrong hill. And they got Jones and they got the skipper and we got to leave and we'll go back in the morning and get them. And uh, so at one point in that campaign, I was the furthest out of anybody. I was, he said, you cover us when the last man comes out, he'll tell you. Well, the last man says, I'm it. He came by, of course, it's noisy. You have to use hand signals mostly. And so, and an and a artillery shell has a relatively looping trajectory, whereas a mortar or bomb, they both sound like wherever you're at, it's coming right for you. It's got your number on it. That's what it sounds like. And so when the last man came out, I gave him a few minutes to clear, and I saw a knocked out American tank there. They started running in mortars. So I started running for that tank, and I thought, no, I don't want to do that. It might draw far. There's only one person. I don't know where they'd waste a shell, but I ain't going to risk it. I dove for a hole, and it eased up, and then I started for another hole, and uh, they, uh, it was too crowded. And the guys in there said, find another hole. There's too many here. You'll draw far. Well, I started for this next 16-inch shell hole, and a 16-inch shell makes, even in sand, makes a considerable hole. With all these guys that I had just covered for were in this big hole. And uh, I heard incoming. I heard a mortar come in, so I dove back for this uh, first hole, and they put three in, boop, 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 just like that. So as, when the third went out, they had been running in, in series of threes, because what they do, they'd fire one and correct on that, and then they'd fire the second, and you better not be there when that third one came, because it, so something wet hit me inside the face, and I looked, and it was a whole ear off a guy. It just stuck to my face. And I disdainfully chucked, threw it away. And, you know, and, and doing this, I, I, I didn't have any emotion about it. You know, I should have had, and I said, what's wrong with me? I should show emotion. I'm not, I didn't show emotion. I went, went to that next hole, and it, there was nothing in that hole bigger than your fist. It, there was probably 15, 16 men destroyed. Well, I ran past there and I fell to my knees and said the Lord's Prayer. I didn't know what else. Then uh, I was talking to a guy, I don't know who the guy was, and he had a word right on his lips and uh, he put his hand up and a little hole below his helmet, a sniper got him, and his heart beat, the blood would gush out. He just fell over. Well, another guy came running up there, and there was a little cut in that area, and he stopped at the same spot where this other guy is, and I tackled him just in time for that sniper to fire again, or he'd have got him. And all I remember is the whites of his eyes scared the living tar of him. He was from Tampa. His name was Blackie. We called him Blackie. And he died of cancer in 89, so I thought, well, I bought him a few years. And uh, he made the, he was able to make the full campaign. So he, uh, uh, like I say, I, these events are not necessarily in order. I'm, I'm recalling, and uh, I saw a stretcher team. They, they were shelling us, and we were scattered like chickens. And uh, it's hard to maintain contact when you're in an intense fire like that. 
And as, as I know today, as I found out when I went back in 95, all these caves, you couldn't see anything. They were well camouflaged. You couldn't see anything. And uh, we, uh, I saw this stretcher team in trouble, and they shoot one of the guys on the rear. So I ran over and gave him, and uh, I, uh, as I did, a, another guy ran over and took the other. So there was two on the back, one on the front. And he was trying to get up the airfield, Motoyama too, and he, but we started across there and I kept telling him, zigzag, don't run straight, zigzag, because machine gun came right with my shoe top. And I kept watching these bullets and uh, he, uh, he didn't hit me. He didn't hit me. I, I got over the other side, I was out of puff, we set the stretcher down, but he got the guy on the stretcher, he, he chewed him up pretty bad. So the guy just cut off his dog tag and uh, rolled his stretcher up and went on. And then I saw a, a guy, this femur bone, both ends sticking through the skin. He's in a state of shock. He didn't know up from down. So I had, on each cartridge belt, you had a little Band-Aid and sulfur powder. So I opened it and took that sulfur powder and sprinkled on that bone and uh, I knew I didn't stand a chance of, of, of uh, bandaging it. So I took his rifle, took my belt and his belt, and strapped it to make his leg rigid like that. And then two guys go by in my company. Armstrong, he was a sergeant. He was my squad sergeant. And in a squad, you had a squad sergeant, three striper. You had a corporal who was a fire team leader, BAR, an automatic rifle, assistant BAR, and uh, rifleman. And you had it three times plus a scout in each squad. So my sergeant went by. And the procedure was when you ran into a pillbox or armored cave, you would fire the slip with a BAR. Somebody would run up with a flamethrower and shoot the box and then you'd go up and set a satchel charge and blow the box and Armstrong flamethrower shot the box Armstrong went up there and he jumped off the box he was on top of the box and he threw that satchel charge jumped off right on a mine and he just he had the dumbest look on his face he just squatted down and, and died right there the only thing, I get Lego on things after this because something big hit and I was just about ear level because I had this mound of dirt in the airfield and I'm walking along there and the last thing that I remember is I wake up in a hospital in a tent. I had no rifle, one dog tag was missing and it startled me because I figured I'll be reported dead because I'd just seen the guy cut the dog tag off that sometime a day or so earlier, whenever, and uh, I had no rifle, no helmet, nothing. I'm sitting in a hospital tent. I didn't know anything. It's, my mind was very sharp, really sharp. My adrenaline was really flowing, but I couldn't hear anything. My ears were whining, and uh, my uh, every time I'd lean back, I'd try to get sick to my stomach and pass out, so I had to sit up straight. I don't know how long, I remember seeing a CB grading, filling in the airfield for planes to land, and he had a carbine set on the back of a bulldozer, and I saw this crimson, I heard a shot, this crimson red go on him, and he took that rifle off, or carbine off, and he bang, 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 there was a lot of the nip planes all knocked out, they'd pushed them off the airfield, so they were, somebody, a sniper got out and crawled in, this happened, they had all the time, that night they'd cry in there. And, Speaking of night, that was the worst time because flares would go up, their flares, then air flares, and invariably somebody would be crying and you'd want to go to them and uh, you knew it was it was trying to draw you out. It was pretty hard to take. It was one of the worst moments. You had to listen to these cries of pain, guys wounded, and you, you couldn't go to them. You knew better than go to them. You knew it. If you knew exactly where to go, you'd go on anyway, but you didn't know where they were. You just heard us. And uh, so, uh, oh, I, I digress on that. 
bulldozer, that guy, I said, you got a trip home. Sometime later, he's back all patched up. He's going again. So next thing I remember is walking aboard a troop ship and some officer taking his shirt off. He had a big guy, had a shirt like this, putting it on me because I didn't have anything else and it was raining a little bit. And he put it on me. I only wore it one time and it fit. <laughs> it was a wool shirt. I never forget that. And uh, I'm a little vague on what happened in between our thing. It, it's like a surreal atmosphere. It's happening, but it really isn't happening. It's like a... And then I got back on the ship, and you'd hear a guy here and there crying a little bit, and uh, that's when it got to me. Up, up until then, I, I had... I kept control all the time. I never lost control. And uh, then I don't remember... I remember getting back to Guam. I don't remember the time. I don't remember... I just on a ship, hospital ship. And uh, this, uh, we came in at night, and uh, they went around the next day. Okinawa casualties were starting to come in. They'd invaded Okinawa the 1st of April, and the casualties were flooding the hospital facilities. I had about a 10-week uh, time to recoup, and I'd been back to duty. And uh, I didn't know, but both eardrums were ruptured. And... Uh, they pushed me back to Pearl Harbor, and uh, then when uh, Okinawa overflowed, casually overflowed Pearl Harbor, they uh, pushed me back in the state, so I got home, and uh, I got back to the East Coast. I had never had any leave in three years, so they gave me 90 days leave, and uh, so I come into after my 30 90-day leave, I get into Philly, and my uh, mother, I'd lose anything there is if it ain't. When St. Peter calls a roll, I say I got another 30 years because I spent that much time looking for things I lost. And so I had given her my papers. She had them home, and I was supposed to report R&R in &R Philly. And it was about the time Japanese surrendered. And... Uh, I come come in on a train this way, and a buddy comes in this way, and he, he says, where are you going? I said, R&R. &R. He says, let's go to New York. I said, I got a report in. He says, where's your papers? I said, I don't have it. And he said, come on, let's go to New York. Well, we we went off New York, whooped it up for two or three days, and the war didn't end. So I got chicken, and I took the train back to Philly, and uh, I reported in the corporal's Where's your papers? I said, my mother's got them in a pocketbook, and I came off without them. He said, what's your name? He went over and got a clipboard, and he went over and made a phone call, and the OD came down and said, you're a prisoner at large. <laughs> so that night, the war ended, and the barracks phone ran off the hook. Parties in Philly, inviting I couldn't go out. I'm in there, so I was there a couple days, and they said, uh, Commandant Marine Corps said, if you were on Iwo, you can go anywhere you want to go. So I, they had schools at Marine Corps headquarters, so I remember telling Dad, I'd get my, I'll go down there and get my education. Oh, incidentally, I was selected for OCS, and uh, I was all stenciled up back in, I was in Boston at this time, and uh, I was ready to go out, and I was telling all the guys, you better shape up or ship out, because I'm coming back for duty here, and I run a tight ship, and I was really pouring it on. And the gunner came running down and said, Russ, you're a high school graduate. I said, no, I'm quitting 11th grade. Oh, got to pull your papers. So I've often reflected back where I would have been. The officers had a high fatality rate. On the Iwo Jima, I had pictures to bring up here of a, our company commander was a private first class because he was a ranking person in the company. We went in with 240, 250 men and came out with 27, 17 of the original men, the rest were replacements. And for a period we had this PFC and he was wounded in the head, in the shoulder, and in the leg. We've tried for years. We still have little get-togethers. There's only about 11 or 12 of us EWO guys left and uh, we're a, 
a sorted bag. One's blind, I'm deaf, and they're all messed up. But we still manage to meet once a year. And this one guy, I just got word at Christmas, the guy who was a PFC, he was senior PFC. We didn't even have a carpool. And he uh, should have got a medal. But nobody of rank, only ones that can test to it, to the guys of lower rank, and he never got his just reward. And Christmas, I found out he's got cancer. He, last summer, he got heart bypasses and all that mess. And the poor guy, it, it's a miscarriage of justice. This guy deserves his reward, and he never got it. Where's he from? He's from Illinois, right outside of St. Louis. And he's a typical hero, very modest, very quiet, sat in here and wouldn't say a word. Unless he asked, he'd answer you, but he uh, very quiet, unassuming, and spent his life being a cement finisher. Went up to the Alaska uh, pipeline and worked on that, and it's good people, and it's a shame. His name's Ford. And uh, he, uh, it's, it's just a cross you got to bear. Here's a guy that was a genuine hero. Could have gone out. He had three wounds he could have gone out of his own. He was up there still firing away. Never got zilch. He got three purple hearts is what he got. And he's going to go to his grave without honorable mention. And it's a shame. We got a, I had a copy of a, uh, my presidential citation, that's the only thing I got. And it it makes mention of the fact that we suffered 2,089 casualties out of 3,000 men. So it testifies to the intention. It was men, men against metal is what it amounted to. And I've read about the charge of the White Brigade and others in the Civil War, that Civil War battle where 7,000 were killed in 10 minutes. I know exactly where they were coming from. I know what it was about because it just I never saw a man take a backward step. Such guts. Such good. I've had people over the years, I went on the Border Patrol, I got shot at on the Border Patrol, so I've been shot at in the States. But uh, I've had people say, weren't you afraid? I said, look, after Iwo Jima, what are you going to be afraid of? And that's always been a catchphrase of mine, what are you going to be afraid of? I haven't been afraid of much. And uh, so that's my story, good, bad, or indifferent, that's it. And are, you, are you sticking to it? I'm sticking to it, yeah. I uh, had left out things that I could have said, but uh, that will give you an insight to what went on. And, and, and You know, time had no meeting up on that island. Uh, minutes were hours, hours were days, days were weeks. It just... I, and you know, I can't remember eating. I remember one time sitting, staring at a dead Japanese, and maggots were all over him, and uh, I'm sitting there eating. And I had a K ration in it. <laughs> after, after the war, first thing I did, my dad was taking me to Wachula, Florida, and we were waiting for a truck shipping the strawberries to Chicago. So one of the old truckers says, if everybody kept in five dollars, I think it was a lot of money in those days, I'll rent the boat, the fishing rods, and we'll go fishing trip and I'll get the food. So there's about five or six of us. We get out on Tampa Bay, they had the beer and all and drinking beer and you end up getting that salt water smell and you're getting hungry and I said, Hey, what'd you get to eat? <laughs> And this guy pulls out cave rations. I was about ready to throw him overboard. I said, oh, I don't believe this. I'm in little Tampa Bay, and he's got cave rations. He, I don't believe this. And he, I said, where'd you? He was an old timer. He didn't, old timer. He was young, a lot younger than I was. But anyway, he says, uh, uh, I went by Army Navy store and said, they only gave the military the best. <laughs> And so he bought him with AK rations. And I, I didn't eat nothing. I didn't. I said, get that mess away from me. I don't want that. But 
that's just a little side note of it. And now, how they say that uh, what did they go on for 60, 60 days, seventy two days. How long did he would you go it, on? It, the original landing was the nineteenth, and it, the March sixteenth was official end date. Well, they but raised my, the flag on the twenty third. That was Thursday or Friday. I don't remember which. So that would be you see Monday. 19th, 20, 21, 22. Must have been Friday, Friday the 23rd, because uh, I remember seeing that, and the ships were all blowing their horns. Everybody was excited, and you could just see something up there. I couldn't make it out as American flag. Of course, I was still on ship, and uh, they uh, uh, put the bigger flag up. Then you you could make it up. Pretty much. What, well, you uh, know what the story is between the little flag and the big flag. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Harry the Horse, I forget his name. That was his nickname. He was a lieutenant colonel. Gave a little flag to go up there. And the ship said, we want that flag. He said, they ain't getting that flag. That's my flag. Well, no. Apparently, the secretary of the Navy, secretary of the Navy. Yeah, was yeah the he was there, uh, and, Farstall. Yeah, and they came and, and they told the colonel. They said, they said the Secretary of Navy wants that flag. Then they and said, they said it, boys, it, and what, what the story was, he says, not when you get up there, if you get up there. And uh, so they went over to the LST and got a larger flag, and that was the one that was and sent. He, and he, he told them, he said, don't take, because <laughs> apparently, I guess they're watching the whole thing on, on, he says, the colonel said, now, don't take that other one down till you get the other one up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a photographer, a Marine Corps sergeant, who was later killed in the campaign, and he uh, was uh, uh, a newsreel photographer. He got newsreel filmage of the exact photograph that Joe Rosenthal had in sequence. And it lay dormant for years because all the acclaim was given to this one picture. So his film it just what it just drug out of the archives a few years back. Oh, I meant to tell you this little story about on Guam. Our regiment, let's see, the Third Marines landed here, 21st Marines and Ninth, and we only lost about two or three guys on Guam. We had a few wounded, but. Whereas the 1st Brigade ran it over here, and they took the old Guam Marine Corps barracks. And the first flag that was flown was the original flag. The Japanese had made it into a pill, and they carefully unstitched it and flew it. It was the first flag re-raised on that flag. When I went back to Guam, one of these park rangers, a young woman, was telling I said, I'll give you one. I said, what happened to the... Marine Corps barracks flag. She says, I haven't heard that one. So I told her this story. I said, I would strongly suspect it's in the archives at Quantico or at Marine Corps headquarters someplace. I said, it was carefully unstitched and it was worn, dirty. That was the first flag that was reflown on the wall. So I gave you my best shot. I don't, I don't know. I hope How I, did you get in the border patrol? Well, I came out, and it. My father was a strong figure, and I was. Every day, the guys are all getting home. We'd meet at the local pub, and beer was in bottles. We take ease the label off, lay it on our pocketbook, and throw it up to the ceiling. And the waitress couldn't figure out. It was a little alcove there, and she couldn't see. And she, we'd spot a lookout down there. He'd sit down there. Here she comes, and we'd quit. And she, what she couldn't figure out. It was a tall ceiling. And these, all these labels getting on us. She couldn't figure out what we were doing. And uh, we meet there every day. And one day, a hand grenade came rolling in the front door and rolling in. And man, I dove behind the the bar. This one guy who jumped on Cregador and the paratroops ran out the back door, and they got him stopped about half a block away. And it it didn't explode. I waited and waited. I said, "This is going to explode." It done it. Now I went over there, and it was a cigarette lighter. But I, who argues when a hand grenade? And so I, if I found that, I'd have beat somebody's hide over that. But 
I threw that cigarette lighter out there. He, he, the cigarette lighter got tore up because I threw it just as hard as I could. And my dad said to me, I heard today, now I'd been home what, five or six months. I hadn't done anything. Drink. He came to me and said, I want to tell you something, young man. They told me today at 10 o'clock you were half drunk. I said, now I want to tell you something. Other men went to war. They saw a lot more than you did, stayed a lot longer, and said they've come home, picked up their lives, and are going on. Now you get a job and straighten up or get out. They were pretty hard words. Went right out, got a job, picked up, went on. But I always had the feeling I, I had survivor's guilt. I didn't know what it was. Uh, survivor's guilt, and I couldn't understand so much better men than me were killed and would have, who knows, maybe the guy that cured cancer would have been. And I could I just couldn't get it out of my, it took me about five years to shake things out. In the meantime, I'm in a reserve for four years. About the time I got straightened out, I uh, joined the Border Patrol. And uh, they went down there and says, the, they greeted us said, you 72 men represent over 5,000 that took the exam. And he goes on and on. And uh, my wife, I came, I took a leave of absence, came down. My wife was a widow of a B-17 pilot who crashed, of course. And uh, I met her and we got married. And uh, then I got motivated for school. Then I went to New Mexico State College. I went to Wesley. I went to, uh, I graduated from ICS, NRI. Went to night school at the University of Pennsylvania. I'd got enough college time to have a doctorate if I had stayed in one direction, but I had electronics and chemistry. So I ended up working at Getty Oil, ended there as a shift foreman, and then came back to Seaford after living in Newcastle for 20 years and became a, uh, had my own auto parts. Uh, my hearing began to go about, since 59 I've had to wear a hearing aids, but this year has gone completely. And now, uh, 25th of January last year, I went to bed and normal, got up 26, I couldn't even carry on the conversation with my wife, my hearing had gone down that bad, so I, I've had to pay a price for all that. And. Uh, I wrote a letter to, as I alluded to earlier, the Lieutenant Jones's mother. She had a letter in the leather neck and said, uh, anyone who knew my son, and I thought like I owed him that much. Uh, and I wrote her, and all, the gist of the message was he died without pain because a sniper got him right under the helmet, and it was instant death. And... Uh, he was a big guy too, and he. Uh, I said, uh, I just told her. She wrote back and she signed it, a broken-hearted mother, and uh, said, I've heard from some of his officer friends and men of the, of the outfit, but said, you were closer to him than anyone I know, and said, I feel at rest now because you were there, you seen it, and there wasn't any suffering. I said, there definitely was no suffering. I didn't tell her we had to go back and get in the next day. But Do you still have the letter? Pardon? Do you still have the letter? Yeah, I still have the letter. And uh, I never, uh, I when I was on the border patrol, I, I'd get time off, and I, you wouldn't be surprised how I'd come home <laughs> on a few days and back in the, I spent the whole time riding, and I went through Tennessee at midnight within 30 miles of York, Yorktown. Yorkville, Yorktown, Yorkville, I think it is. And uh, it was named after Alvin York. I think he was from there. And uh, I didn't stop. And that's when a, and her other son was a legislator in the legislature of Tennessee. And somehow he got wind that I had written his mother. And he was going to get in touch with him. And the guy said, you ought to get in touch with him. Well, as it turned out, he got Alzheimer's, and I never made, made that move, so I never made the contact. But I still remember the last first letter I wrote home. I wrote home when I was, whenever, I don't know, I'm probably on Guam. I said, Mom, I'm alive and well in one piece. 
for one reason and one reason only, the will and grace of God. She died at the age of 99 in uh, uh, 2000. She got to live in two centuries. And uh, she, and everything is, I've never found it, but it, I'm sure she still got that letter around there someplace. I'd like to have it back, but I still don't know what it says. I, you know, <laughs> we get to uh, San Francisco to a receiving hospital, and they, they said, now, we're going to stop the bus. Nobody, they had all these phones in a circle, back-to-back -back telephones all around this circle. No one is to call home until muster is held. As soon as that bus door was open, I was the first one at the, at the, at the phone, and I called home, and I called, Mom, I'm back in the States. She started crying, and I said to her, Look, if you don't quit crying, I'm going to hang up. But she bawled. Where was it? Uh, was it uh, the Presidio was the hospital? I, or was it over at Fort Baker? I have no idea. Well, that, that's another story. While in Boston, I was armed escort to, uh, we had two freight cars in a canvas that high, and we took them from Boston to Port Chicago. And I was only there relatively short time before that place blew up. It blew up. And uh, we had these cars, and I had submachine gun, and any time the train stopped, we uh where was port chicago in texas no, no. it's it's around uh, san francisco someplace oh okay and uh we uh uh took every time you change railroads you get a new caboose and you'd have to load all this stuff up and we'd ride mostly at night because when you got out west there's single track and on the daytime you'd pull on a siding so you'd be standing out there guarding your cars we get to uh, Salt Lake City. Lieutenant was from Salt Lake City. We had a lieutenant, a corporal, three PFCs, gardeners. This is the garden detail. One guy would ride up in front in the in the engine, and uh, this lieutenant got we got to Salt Lake City, and he uh, said, "Man, I wish I could stay here a few days." This corporal said, "You want to stay here a few days?" Now they told us these cars would blow a whole city block square. This was a potential. And uh, he took the packing, you know, a railroad that flap, they got packing in there, cotton packing, and it's oiled. It oils that hub. He took all that packing out of there, and we hadn't even got out of the yard before the flames were coming up. <laughs> we, had, we had cars that would blow a city block. It was coming up the side Well, they stopped. And because it was priority cargo, they didn't shift it to another car. Wouldn't let them touch that car. They had to put a new dolly. They had to get a big wrecker, lift that car up, and put a new dolly uh, wheels on. So we got another three or four days in Salt, Salt Lake City. Well, we got there. This, this uh, lieutenant got... I never heard, but I... I for sure, but I heard he, he'd been killed overseas uh, Officers had a high fatality rate. We didn't end up with any officers in our company. They had a, they'd send up a replacement lieutenant, and he wouldn't make a day out. They, somebody had it. Anybody that looked like they was in, were in authority, bang, they were gone. And uh, so uh, they uh, and uh, I one time in Boston. Uh, I feel like for Gordon Mountain, I had this submachine gun, and this lieutenant said, you pulled and he grabbed it. He said, you didn't clean this weapon. I said, beg your pardon, sir, I did. He said, I said, you didn't clean it. He said, beg your pardon, sir, I did. He says, see me after Gordon Mountain. He said, open that weapon. I opened it, and the ejector had a little strand from a patch, a little strand of string. What's that? That's clean it? I said, well, I ran a patch. You ran a patch through it. I'm running you up. So he run me up to the first sergeant, I know the first sergeant, the company commander, and he says, you know you were at the point of being insubordinate. I said, well, I didn't mean to be, sir. I, I 
felt like I did clean it. Well, you didn't clean it. I said, yeah, I guess in strictest terms, I didn't. He says, well, I'm busting you to private, and you got 76 hours extra police duty. So I reported into the first sergeant, and he says, you, uh, that guy, blankety blank, if you do all the windows of the barracks, uh, I'll mark that 72 hours off the books. So I had a four-story barracks that had been the British. It was one, two, three, yeah, it was four stories. And uh, uh, it was, I had to hang out the window and wash all those windows. I did them all. Some of them were on a, had a deck on this side. You could get them easy, but the, other, the north side, I had to hang out the window to do it. And uh, so it'd been a, uh, so I went out on Liberty and I'm in a bar and this guy was sitting here sideways, was been a professional middleweight fighter. And I know him, he's a buck sergeant. I'm sitting beside him and an arm came around and he says, Lieutenant, drunk as a skunk. And he said, Rush, you know I had to run you up. And I, I can't quote what this sergeant said. And they were they were kibitzing back and forth. And I said, I knew this bar, it was a long bar, had a little alley in back. And I said, Why don't you two go down an alley set of this? Nobody be around. Okay, so the lieutenant gave me his hat to hold and an officer had a cross woven on his hat. That dated back to the Revolutionary War when the officers had it on their hats so the snipers in the rigging far down they wouldn't get an officer. They didn't care about to listen to the officers. So I go out back and I knew this guy had been a professional fighter and he says, he, gonna, he hit that lieutenant and the lieutenant was a lot bigger than he was but he was drunk and down he went. Well, he said, come on, let's go. I said, no, nah, I ain't going to leave him like that. I went and got a paper towel with it his eye was bleeding, and I cleaned him up. So I said, come on, I'll get you a cab. Well, he couldn't get up. He's on the ground. Well, I got him in a fireman's carry, and I walked down the alley and I hailed the cab, and the cab was just shaking his head. I get him in the cab and put him in the cab, and I stopped by a white tower and poured a cup of coffee in him. Took him down. The officers had their own gate, so he went down. And I didn't hear nothing from him. And there'd been a fight over the Navy PX, and they said, nobody, no Marines in the Navy PX. Well, the lights went out, everybody's hungry. I went over to get coffee, and uh, these little turnovers, apple turnovers and all that, cherry turnover. And I had two bags of them, I'm coming back, run right smack into this lieutenant again. He's a, <laughs> and he says to me, he says, come here. He took me back and says, what's that sign on the door saying? So I read it, no Marines, I'm out in the, oh, you can read, can you? And I'm thinking, pal, next time you stay in the alley. I won't leave you in the alley next time. And then he said, oh, he said, just a good thing I caught you. And don't go over there no more. And, and by the way, thanks for the other night. I didn't even think he remembered what he did. And the poor guy went over Saipan and got, got killed. So I got a lot of stories like that and things that I've. Uh, so tell me, uh, what would you tell? Uh, what would you tell if you had a message for other gen for, the, for generations to come about World War II? What would you say? Uh, what would I say in a in a few words? Uh, well, from my own perspective. I grew up in the Marine Corps. I was a happy-go-lucky kid, and I easily would have made the Marine Corps my, I would have stayed there. My intent was to get out and get my commission and go back. I didn't want to go back as an enlisted man. And I would just say that no matter what your situation, it'll work out. No matter what your given situation, it'll work out. And how do I know? Because it always has for me. And uh, there are times when you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, when you say it's an impossible situation. But I'm living proof. I went through hell of the worst salt. And I, even this, when I went back in 95, the sulfur plumes are still coming up. And I thought of that. I said, every picture ever painted of hell was sulfur. I said, they got it all. They had it all. They, it was, 
And when I when I went back this time and looked in those caves, and I went down in Kurabash's cave, and thought, oh, they had us under their gun sight ever. So. I at the time I thought they were uh, they were firing. I was blaming the other divisions for firing on us. It wasn't them at all. It was Japanese crawling underground, coming back positions we'd already knocked out and firing from the rear. We never knew where the fire was coming from. But I'm digressing, I didn't mean to, but no, whatever your situation, World War II was a bad war. And uh, the only difference from one war to another is the weaponry. The stark horror and all stays the same. That The bloodshed stays the same. The weaponry changes. Now, uh, so uh, war is is mankind and it, it is very worse. And uh, we were fortunate in World War II that the politicians allowed us to win the war, and they messed up the peace. But war, since the UN got involved, has saw the politicians mess up the war and the peace with few exceptions. The politicians get in the way and micromanage the war and we end up with a thing like Vietnam. I had my nephew come and say, Uncle Vaughn, you were in the Marines. I would like to join the Marines about 69. And I said, Jack, I'd love for you to go in the Marines. What you ask me, and I'm going to tell you, this war is a no-win war. There are no defined goals. My advice to you, you study electronics, go into the Navy and, and get your schooling. So that's what he did. And I've never re regretted that. When my son was sitting at the table for Thanksgiving and he was crying and moaning but he had to go back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And uh, it was Thanksgiving and his girl was there. And I said, I want to tell you something, mister. At this table, you don't say that. I said, you took the easy way out. You didn't go to Canada, but you joined the National Guard and got to put in a year's duty and you're back home. There's many a boy in Vietnam would love to be home, but uh, he can't be home. You're home. Don't you ever at this table ever say that again. And uh, my in-laws were there and my wife said, oh, you really upset mom. And I said, well, mom and dad. I said, well, I'm sorry I upset them, but he had to be told, and I told him. So, well, I, I was blessed with a good memory, and a good memory stands in good stead sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't, because I have to live with this garbage in my head, and uh, sometimes it gets hard to live with. But I can look in the mirror and say, I did my thing. I did it, and I never took a backward step. I never saw anyone that did. So. I guess I had something going for me. <laughs>